so is do people believe you can pay for it? Let's have respect for everyone who wants to ask a question. I don't think people get much out of seeing politicians having a go at each other. Can anything be done about the shockingly biased media? Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post. Here are some of the media stories we're covering this week. As Britain prepares to go to the polls with the right-wing press backing the government, can the left-wing Labour Party and its leader get their message out? Journalism in the Sinai. There isn't much of it, as Cairo tries to control the narrative. Yet another Mexican reporter pays for his work with his life. And what if everybody spoke the way broadcast journalists do? I'm standing here at a bus stop. The mood? Tense. Would anyone be taken seriously? Britain is in the midst of a snap election campaign. The vote is June 8th. And the way the story is being covered could well end up being a factor in the end result. This past Tuesday, the opposition Labour Party, led by Jeremy Corbyn, officially released its manifesto, its election platform. There were no big surprises in there because five days earlier, it had been leaked to the press. Presumably, that leak came from inside the Labour camp. But it's difficult to pinpoint the source because the party's divided between those who support Corbyn and his push to the left and those who want to keep Labour where it was, more of a centre-left party. In fact, Jeremy Corbyn's leadership is a major subplot in the election story. That it's an obsession of the right-wing press, which dominates the print market in the UK, is to be expected. The Sun, the Daily Mail and others have been openly hostile toward Corbyn ever since he took over the leadership in 2015. But has there been a more subtle form of anti-Corbyn, anti-Labour bias in the country's broadcast media, which under UK regulatory laws are legally required to be balanced in their coverage? Our starting point this week is London. There are multiple media moments that Jeremy Corbyn and his supporters cite to illustrate all that they disapprove of in the British news media. This article was one that went viral. The byline belongs to the BBC's political editor, and the headline is an almost word-for-word, -word, almost cut-and-dried case of cut-and-paste journalism that echoes a three-part mantra the Tory government has repeatedly used to describe the Labour Party's economic policies. Laura Koonsberg, the BBC political editor, used the exact same subclauses. So I think journalists over time will be seen more and more as press officers of the party of government, because that's what they are, which is why I do the work I do with Navarro Media, because the print media, and even to an extent the BBC, aren't going to do it for us. We are always going to study carefully Labour's spending plans. The shadow chancellor, uh, John McDonnell, on the morning of the manifesto launch, he was asked the size of the British deficit currently. What is Britain's also, deficit at the moment, Mr. If I, if I can say... He did not know. And the presenter on the Today programme said, Shadow Chancellor, are you looking up the figure? Not at all. It just sounds like there was a bit of paper being it's, handed no, across no, there. No, no, no. The figure he gave of 68 to 70 billion, the deficit is in fact 52 billion. The shadow chancellor doesn't even know what the deficit is, so of course we're entitled to ask, do their figures add up? Of course, the Tories have just presided over a massive devaluation, not for the first time, and nobody's talking about it. Because the Tories seem to be always perceived as being the ones who are better at managing money, because, hey, they've got more money, the Daily Mail has quoted the Institute of Fiscal Studies saying that Corbyn could be facing a black hole of about 30 billion. Well, compare that to Tory economic predictions, they're out by much more than that. So who actually is fiscally incompetent here? Jeremy Corbyn's difficulties with the British news media are not all rooted in ideology. His determination to move his Labour Party to the political left in a country where 70% of the newspaper market tilts to the right. His party is split. When Corbyn ran for Labour leader in 2015 as an outsider, few expected him to win. He attracted record numbers of new members to the party, most of whom voted for him. But 90% of Labour's parliamentary wing, his fellow MPs, voted against Corbyn, with many saying he was simply unelectable. Faced with enemies within, armed with leftist policies, and a determination not to play the media game the way most British politicians do, all of that 
put Corbyn on a collision course with the journalists covering him. Jeremy Corbyn is not used to being doorstepped, as we call it. He's not used to having the press, TV cameras outside his front door, outside his office door. Is Labour going to be wiped out, Jeremy? He's not developed an easy manner with how to reply. Instead, he's chippy, cross, indignant. Do you mind the way, please, so I can get in the car? And looks thin-skinned, and the public can see it. Corbyn does not seem to have grasped how the media see him and therefore how he interacts with the media. From their point of view, he's not just the leader of the Labour Party. He is the leader of the opposition and he needs to be acting accordingly. Nor has he been giving them the chunks of red meat that they need to feed on in order to do stories. Yet, it's evident that many, many people find his very direct, authentic way of speaking. We lost the election, I believe, because we didn't offer a clear enough alternative to the... A viable antidote to the construction of popular personalities. And if we think about this election and its mediated process in a wider context, we of course have to think about a reality television show host being elected to become president of the United States. Cults of political personalities don't end up with the best outcome. The last two British elections in 2010 and 2015 have included televised leaders' debates. Over a campaign lasting almost two months, debates allow voters to, for a few hours at least, examine candidates and their policies without having the event filtered by and through a media outlet. I've got a question in from Jeremy Corbyn of Islington. Except in this election, Prime Minister Theresa May, who was running on a platform of strong and stable leadership, simply refuses to take part in one. I don't think people get much out of seeing politicians um, sort of having a go at each other. In 2010, Gordon Brown didn't want to do them. David Cameron was calling him out and eventually he caved in because that's what people wanted. And Theresa May has to do the same thing. If she doesn't, if she hasn't got the bottle to go on TV and defend her record, I don't really trust her to do very much at all, to be frank. And she dismisses the idea of live television debate as insignificant Although we've had Trump debating Clinton, we've had Macron debating Le Pen, and even that bastion of global democracy, the Islamic Republic of Iran, is running television debates. So it's quite counter to the spirit of democracy that the existing prime minister absents herself from this kind of debate. Remember that judicial inquiry into the relationship between press and politics in Britain triggered by the phone hacking scandal at Rupert Murdoch's newspapers? Its primary recommendation, delivered in 2012, that British papers work under statutory regulations the way broadcasters do, was ignored by the government. However, the inquiry's work was unfinished. Phase two was delayed because so many phone hacking cases were still before the courts. Although former Prime Minister David Cameron promised that phase two would go ahead, his successor is now reneging on that. It's right there in the Conservative manifesto. The phone hacking scandal cost Murdoch's news outlets tens of millions in legal fees and out-of-court settlements. But that's all. Nothing else has changed. Rupert Murdoch is a supremely powerful man in, in British public life. In 18 months, between spring summer 2015 and the autumn of 2016. There were 20 meetings between either Murdoch or his representatives and the Prime Minister, the Chancellor or the Culture Secretary. 20 meetings. The inference for your viewers I think is pretty obvious. This is not how a democracy is run and to me it looks like corruption and the most tragic thing of all is it's hidden in plain sight. On the download now, our viewers on the coverage of the British elections and what it says about the state of the news media there. Theresa May is right to refuse to debate Jeremy Corbyn. There's only little time left before the election and the public have seen so much of them debate on PMQs every Wednesday already. 
Plus, we have to bear in mind that this isn't a presidential election, it's a parliamentary election, which means that the public will be electing their local members of parliament, not voting for Theresa May or Jeremy Corbyn. I don't think that she is being fair to the electorate. To see Theresa May, Jeremy Corbyn, Tim Farron, other party leaders actually engaging in debate and being accountable to one another and sort of discussing the issues and getting everything out in the open. Of course, it is important that they speak to the electorate, but I also think that it is important that we see them interact with each other and really debate the key issues facing the country. Other media stories that are on our radar this week, it continues to be open season on journalists in Mexico with the killing of yet another reporter, one that occurred in broad daylight, a crime that the president has called outrageous. Javier Valdez Cardenas was shot by a lone gunman after being pulled out of his car while driving in the southwestern city of Culiacan, May 15th. Valdez covered the drug cartel story, authored several books, edited a weekly newspaper in Culiacan called Rio Doce, and was a correspondent for La Jornada, a national newspaper, as well as for the Agence France Press news agency. In addition to what President Enrique Peña Nieto said about the killing, the National Human Rights Commission said this is an unacceptable and reproachable act which affects freedom of expression and the very heart of Mexican democracy. According to the New York-based media freedom organization, the Committee to Protect Journalists, 41 reporters in Mexico have been killed for their work since 1992. There could be another 50 such cases, but the motives in those killings remain unclear. The issue ultimately comes down to impunity. Again, according to the CPJ, between 2006 and 2016, 21 Mexican journalists were murdered. None of the perpetrators has been convicted for their crimes. Two of the biggest newsmakers of the digital age who were part of the same story were back in the news this past week. Sweden has dropped all rape charges against Julian Assange of WikiLeaks. And Chelsea Manning, the U.S. Army private turned whistleblower, is finally free after nearly seven years behind bars. I'm Julian Assange. Sweden's chief prosecutor terminated the investigation of Assange this past Friday, saying all prospects of pursuing the investigation under present circumstances are exhausted. The Swedes issued an arrest warrant in 2010, but never charged Assange with a crime. He refused to go to Stockholm to face questioning, fearing, he said, that he would be extradited to the U.S. He offered to be questioned at the Ecuadorian embassy in London, where Assange took refuge in 2012. It took the Swedes four years to do that. And now, six months later, they've dropped the charges. Assange's lawyers say he has no immediate plans to leave the embassy until he receives assurances he won't then be arrested by British police. Two days before that news, Chelsea Manning walked out of a U.S. military prison in Kansas 28 years earlier than the original sentence called for. The soldier, who entered prison as a man but now identifies as a transgender woman, had her sentence commuted by former President Barack Obama. Manning posted a picture of herself on Twitter a day after her release. However, her lawyers have said she will not be speaking to the media anytime soon. A four-hour siege of Afghanistan state-owned broadcaster in Jalalabad has left at least six people dead and 24 wounded. On May 17th, five suicide bombers stormed RTA's building and a firefight ensued. One of them detonated his bomb at the entrance of the compound, three others were killed by security forces, and one was captured alive. ISIL has claimed responsibility. It has a strong presence in the eastern province of Nangarhar, where it's fighting both the Taliban and government forces. The attack on RTA took place just over a week after the leader of ISIL in Afghanistan was killed in a U.S. drone strike. The Afghan Journalists' Safety Committee condemned the attack and called it a violation of the rules of war that protect media as civilians. We're going to look at a story now that you don't hear much about because it's unfolding in a place that by government design has become a black hole for news. Month after month, there are dozens of attacks against security forces carried out by an ISIS affiliate in an area that's been in an almost constant state of emergency since 2014. It's northern Sinai in Egypt, and the fighting there is proving to be a major headache for President Sisi, who has sold himself at home and abroad as the only guarantor of Egypt's security and stability. Sisi's government, which has already put dozens of journalists in jail, has also put a lid on independent reporting in Sinai. Journalism that deviates from the official accounts has been criminalized under an anti-terror law. And a narrative is being pushed out 
across all forms of pro-government media that the Army's operations in Sinai are successful, just, even heroic. But that doesn't always square with the evidence. The most recent case in point being a video that was leaked, appearing to show brutal extrajudicial killings carried out by militias fighting on the government's side. The Listening Post's Tarek Nafi now on the insurgency that's getting the silent treatment and the stories going untold in Sinai. It's not that Egyptians don't hear about what is happening in northern Sinai, it's just that most of the time what they hear sounds something like this. The government in Cairo wants Egyptians and the international community to believe it has the insurgency in Sinai completely under control, that it's winning the war and winning over the people. It's a carefully crafted narrative that, without independent scrutiny, is near impossible to verify. Whenever you have a war uh, going on like this, you tend to have restrictions on the media. Media access is closely controlled. But it's not just journalists. I mean, there's no independent or potentially critical perspective kind of allowed into Sinai. Or in the case of people who already live there, you know, their views, their testimonies, their uh, accounts are not allowed out of Sinai. The only source of information is the regime itself. And considering that the insurgency is basically getting worse and the regime is not able to control it, every security blunder is undermining the legitimacy of the uh, regime itself. There's two parts to the Egyptian narrative, and, and one part of it may be true, the other part is pure spin. And the bit that's true is that there is an insurgency in northern Sinai. We know the area is awash with smuggled weapons from other countries, um, and we know that there's a degree of this sort of lawlessness there. The bit that's spin, and the bit that has been swallowed wholesale by much of the Egyptian population, and quite honestly, the international community, is that Egypt is winning this war, uh, and that it is completely a sound strategy for Egypt to fight terror with terror. In April this year, a video surfaced that shattered the government-managed media narrative and renewed allegations of torture, forced disappearances and killings at the hands of the Egyptian army. It appeared to show a group of government-backed militiamen executing two captives. Researchers and activists recognised at least two of the civilians in the video. Back in November 2016, images and videos of their deaths were circulated online by government and pro-government groups. The men were the same, but there was a very different narrative about how they'd been killed. The military spokesperson described the men as terrorists that were killed during an anti-terror operation in northern Sinai. But the leaked video clearly shows that at least two of the men are unarmed at the time. Our analysis indicates that the, the arms were later planted next to their bodies to make it look like there was an exchange of fire. <laughs> So the contradiction between the two accounts raises a lot of questions about, first of all, the credibility of the reports that comes from the government and also the accuracy of the kind of other information that we get from the statements that are propagated or produced by the military spokesmen and official accounts. The government has chosen to remain silent about the execution video. Many Egyptian media outlets did not. The source of the leaked video, Mekemmelin, is an Istanbul-based opposition channel that is affiliated with the outlawed political group, the Muslim Brotherhood. Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International have produced detailed accounts that aim to verify the footage. But many Egyptian outlets accused Mekemmelin of not just faking the video, but of collaborating with foreign players, including Qatar and Al Jazeera, to produce and publicize it.
The Egyptian media is heavily dominated by regime affiliated newspapers and uh, channels. And they have been pushing the narrative of the conspiracy theory since late 2012 even. So the reaction to the video was twofold. There is one fold which basically claimed that it's a fabricated video by the Brotherhood. The second was claiming that it was a fabricated video but by foreign governments, foreign enemies that are trying to tarnish the military. And since it is a foreign conspiracy, then the only approach is to crush it by brute force. The Egyptian government has an interest in maintaining its narrative of successfully fighting terror. Between 2011 and 2015, Cairo received $6.5 billion in US military aid. But at what cost? The Egyptian military has reported more than 6,000 deaths in northern Sinai since mid-2013. That figure greatly exceeds the number of militants in the area, no more than 1,000 according to the DC-based think tank, the Tahrir Institute for Middle East Policy. The inability to verify what is really happening has created a void for the ISIS-affiliated Wilayat Sinai to fill with its own propaganda. Its latest release portrays its fighters as disciplined and methodical, patiently aiming and then firing at Egyptian soldiers who are made to appear panicked and vulnerable. When you are prohibiting and stopping access for journalists, reporters and researchers to investigate and report on what's happening there, you are creating a knowledge gap. And when you're doing that, this gap is also being filled with the terror group's propaganda. And it's very important that the Egyptian government realize that it's actually in the interest of the military that they actually allow independent researchers and journalists to have access to what's going on there. There was rare access granted to Egyptian journalists in April. The Department of Morale Affairs that manages the military's public image organized a press field day, taking journalists to see the aftermath of what was called a decisive victory. Critical voices, though, have been silenced. Ismail Skandarani, a prominent Sinai researcher and journalist, was arrested in December 2015 on charges of spreading false news and being a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. He has now been in jail without trial for a year and a half. Ismail Skandarani is the perfect example of how the regime is not tolerating any independent views. The reason that he caught the government's attention is that he was critical of the military's way of handling the insurgency. He was really a treasure of knowledge that could have been used by the government to actually devise a strategy that works rather than use the hammer. You know, detaining journalists not only silences those individuals, but it silences the press, the media, uh, more generally, when they see this kind of uh, takedown of their colleagues on allegations such as, you know, spreading rumors, false news, this kind of thing, well, they tend to be very careful about what they say and very often don't say anything. The problem here is that it's not allowing for another independent voice that would humanize the people living in the region. There's just shadows on the wall. It doesn't matter if they die, it doesn't matter if they live. Nobody understands them and nobody wants to. And that's the real tragedy. Finally, tune into your news channel of choice, and when the anchor begins to speak, that voice, that delivery, that tone of solemn sincerity is instantly recognizable. Every media culture places its own vocal stamp on the news, and one of the most recognizable comes from Britain's BBC. You've heard that clipped delivery, that familiar cadence on the BBC's World Service or on its satellite television channels. But how would it sound in the pub or on a night out with your friends? You're about to find out, thanks to a UK comedy duo called Midbrow. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. Hi, Mark. A very good evening to you. It's David. I'm standing at the bar we agreed to meet at, just wondering what the latest is on your arrival. Yes, hello, David. 
I'm standing here at a bus stop. The mood, tense. And one thing is becoming evidently clear is that my bus is officially delayed. I've interviewed a number of the bystanders here and they have indeed informed me. I'm in a short walk from the bar. And joining me now is Mark Delaney. So Mark, from what I understand, things haven't been going so well for you at home recently. Yes, David, it's hard to deny those allegations. Uh, certainly a testing time for Mark Delaney at the moment, and I should know as I am him. Problems arose about several months ago when his wife realised he can't stop talking like a newscaster. Well, Mark, I would hate to be you. 